Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I have Brett Alderman. Brett has a PhD in clinical psych. He's also a life coach. He's an author and just an all around bright and really awesome person. Um, I greatly enjoyed this conversation with him and we, we hit some really heavy topics in this conversation. We start the conversation giving an overview of postmodernism and deconstructionism. Brett wrote a book, uh, which is in the notes section of this podcast, uh, that everyone should pick up and check out. It's well written. It's a great book. And so a lot of the conversation that we have, um, he expands on these ideas and these topics um, in his book. So it's, it's, it's very, very good. Um, we talk about why language is a primary focus for the deconstructionist. Um, we talk about the structuralism of language and some of the origins with that. We talk about how the postmodern philosophers view language and how that's different from structuralism. We then, we, you know, we talk about some of the problems with postmodernism and deconstructionism, but we really give a charitable view of it, right? You know, uh, I'm less sympathetic towards it. He's less sympathetic towards it, but we see some of the utility and we see, you know, we try to really, really take a balanced and neutral position on this. Um, you know, we have criticisms, but you know, what are some of the potential uh, values that it could have, or, you know, some of it as a kind of, um, exercise. Um, we talk about the concepts of the other power oppression, um, these are kind of big tenets for deconstructionism and, and postmodernism. And so we talk a little bit about that. We then had a really, I, you know, I really enjoyed it. Um, and I hope it's a instructive conversation on lived experience. Um, this is a trendy, uh, a very trendy term at the moment in society. Many different people groups and, and folks are using you know, lived experience and, you know, more generally people are using this, this kind of phrase. And so Brett and I um, have both read and are um, fans of Edmund Husserl, who's the grandfather of phenomenology, who coined this term lived experience. And so for Brett and I, we think of lived experience in the way that Husserl, you know, came up with the term, you know, how he coined it. And so we talk pretty extensively, I think, ab about lived experience and how Husserl meant it and how he defined it since he coined the term. And again, we spent a good bit of time on that because we wanted to make sure that there was an explanation of, hey, where does this term come from and what was the author's original intent? And so we spent quite a bit of time on that. And, and then we, we juxtapose it with how there's a lot of confusion and how it's sort of been hijacked by uh, certain, certain groups of people or, you know, knowingly or unknowingly um, in society and how it is, you know, the term lived experience um, maybe means something for certain people, but it is not an accurate, and, but on his reading and my reading of, you know, Husserl's understanding of uh, lived experience. And so. Um, I, I feel like we give a charitable explanation of some of the differences there and, and how they could be, um, you know, maybe there's just a, another phrase that needs to be used as opposed to lived experience. We then spend a good amount of time on Merleau-Ponty's, um, contribution to phenomenology, the subset of, of philosophy, um, in his focus on the body. We give lots of ex ex uh, examples, and we talk about his philosophy overall, which I found super rewarding and enriching because, you know, I don't find a lot of interlocutors with uh, with Merleau Ponty. He's kind of very underrated. People don't talk about him that much, and um, Brett's read a lot about on him. I've read a lot of Merleau Ponty, and so it was very nice. And so, hopefully, for for folks that are listening, they will be, their interest will be piqued and they will check out Merleau Ponty. He's, he's fabulous. Um, towards the end, we kind of give a 
more of an explanation on his particular concept of how he understands space. Um, and then we talk about a variety of other uh, topics intermixed in this episode. So again, this was very, very good. Um, I had to make the hard decision towards the end to, you know, not get into Carl Jung. We <laughs> had uh, pushed the pushed the time limit on this one, and Carl Jung would have put us well over three hours, and I wanted to get Carl Jung um, his own time uh, on a separate episode, which uh, just gives me a good excuse to get Brett on here again, since he's a, a big uh, big fan of, of Carl Jung and has, you know, written on him. So hopefully we can do that in the future. So now I bring you Brett Alderman. I am here with Brett Alderman. Brett, what's going on, man? Uh, I'm hanging in, hanging in. It's not the the most beautiful moment in our nation's history, but uh, you know I'm doing pretty well under the circumstances. Yeah, yeah, I I, I hear you on that. I um I agree. It's uh it's been it's been pretty tough. Uh, we're recording this kind of beginning of the year. I'm not too sure when it will get released, uh, specific dates, but, um, yeah, all the recent stuff with, uh, uh, Capitol and, you know, lead up to the inauguration and, you know, post, uh, election stuff. And so it's just been pretty, uh, pretty serious. So yeah. we'll see how it plays out. Hopefully, um, you know, calmly, um, so just for listeners, uh, I've been following Brett for a little bit, uh, mostly online. And we had this conversation penciled in, I think, since like October or November. So I have wow. been itching to get him on here <laughs> and talk about a lot of things. And so I'm excited. I, I think that's I think you might be the longest. You know, we're both busy people. And so getting having you on the calendar. And so it's like, OK, you know, here it is. So I'm, I'm very excited. Um, okay, so why don't you tell listeners, um, you know, who you are, what's your day job, what's your, um, you know, academic background and what your experience and expertise is, what you're working on now and any other future projects? Well, I am a life coach with a PhD in psychology that I received from the Pacifica Graduate Institute. I'm also an author. I wrote a book called Symptom, Symbol, and the Other of Language, a Jungian Interpretation of the Linguistic Turn. Uh, and I would, my, my field of expertise, uh, I don't know that I have, I don't know that I'm an expert. I don't even know if I even accept the, the notion of expert per se, but I do have a background in depth psychology and I, I, have a fair amount of reading in um, things like post-structuralism, deconstruction, and uh, phenomenology, um, self-taught, not formally trained in those fields, but um, trying to make sense of them as mm -hmm. you are. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. Yeah, I, um, I, I was at some point definitely going to going to plug the book and get into it. So I'll just, just a good point here. Um, I've, I've read the book. Uh, you've graciously let me uh, have a copy and um, it was, you know, I don't, I don't really try to have expectations when I read books. I'm just like, Oh, this is interesting. Let me just see the ideas. Mm -hmm. And so I was uh, um, very much uh, pleased. It's well-written, very well-written and uh, great ideas, really good synthesis. Um, I liked how you tied everything together. Uh, it's not very long uh, for some listeners if they want to get it. It's not uh, it's not war and peace, um, <laughs> uh, and it's great. It's really really good. So we can tackle some of those issues. Um, so maybe maybe uh, sort of connected to that because there's a lot of that in the book, at least for the first part. But um, I I want to talk about there's a few things I want to get into today, but I think maybe the first area that would be good as a kind of laying the groundwork would be explaining to uh, listeners what, how your understanding and reading of uh, postmodernism in terms of uh, philosophical thought and deconstructionalism and, you know, just kind of some of the main tenets, big players, uh, main aims. We can maybe start there and then we'll branch off into some of the other ideas. Sounds good. Um... You know, it's postmodernism, I think, is one of these 
huge blanket terms that we use to say an awful lot in a very short um, amount of time. And it's, it's not always entirely fair to people. Um, and I just want to state that caveat to begin with. Mm-hmm. Um, when I say postmodernism, I'm thinking specifically of things like deconstruction and post-structuralism. I'm thinking of authors like Jacques Derrida and Michel Foucault. I'm also thinking of um, Richard Rorty, who calls himself a pragmatist. Others call him a neo-pragmatist. But one of the things that all of these authors have in common, and one of the reasons that I like to focus in on them, is that I think they're all uh, particularly good exemplars of a an understanding of language that has been really fundamental to a real shift in our worldview, kind of a shift when we go from what we're talking about modernism to postmodernism. And the shift involves a different understanding of how we create meaning out of language and what our words actually refer to. And the there's a recurrent idea, kind of a, a theme, a leitmotif in these authors that says that basically our language doesn't refer to or hook up with or represent anything that might be called out, outside of itself. So our words don't really hook up with an objective reality would be one way of thinking about it. Or another way of thinking about it might be that our words don't hook up with or refer to um, a perceived reality, you know, a phenomenal reality. So you get this sort of image of language as sort of being ungrounded, um, sort of, I, I like to use the word dissociated because I like to bring all of these ideas back into kind of a psychological context. Because one of the points that I like to keep coming back to is that these postmodern ideas are just ideas in general. They're always they always have a psychological dimension, mm-hmm. um, you know. So I like to think through the ideas, but not just as a as a philosopher, because that's really not my training. But think through the ideas and ask what is the the psychological significance of them. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that answers your question. No, no, no. That's great. That's great. There's one of the questions I had, and so you've already kind of teed me up for this. Is why and you you write about this a lot in 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 the book, but why um is there this you know you could at least emphasis and you know maybe some might say this obsession the mm-hmm. deconstructionists have with language. But why why do they? You know, there's so many, you know, if you read Heidegger, it's being, if you read, you know, Descartes, it's, you know, the self, you read Plato, it's, you know, each kind of philosopher has their kind of thing, right, which is fine. But for the deconstructionists, why is it um, language? Like, why are they almost this rumination on, (laughs) you know, language and what it is and what it isn't? Explain that as as best you can. That's a good question. Um... There's a couple different ways I can think about it. I mean, I can think about it just historically. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there was um, Ferdinand Saussure, the great structuralist linguist, who had this basic idea that all thought was in some way mediated by language. And, and he was very influential, and he gave people a new way of thinking about language as, as, as a structure. Um, and that was very influential and, and sort of set the stage for later historic developments. But I, that doesn't quite answer the question that you're ask, asking. It's a, it's a really good question. For me, I, I think in a lot of ways that the focus on language is a little bit the result of having hit a dead end. 
and just really coming to the conclusion that we have all these philosophical questions that we just can't resolve. And so the idea arose, well, maybe if we just look at the language and, and the grammar and just like really look at, you know, things like syntax and see, you know, we have this medium that we're speaking through and we don't look at the medium itself. We look at, you know, what we're trying to talk about. So, you know, you get, you know, people like Wittgenstein and a lot of different philosophers who are looking at, well, how does language work? And, you know, maybe we can start to resolve this, these issues through that. And, um, but I, I wonder though, also at the same time, if there aren't sort of deeper causes for that. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how to express that, but I know that increasingly we are, and when I say we, I guess the West, uh, you know, contemporary human beings were sort of enamored of representation. We are transfixed by screens. Increasingly, what we do has to do with, you know, reading words or looking at images. And we're almost hypnotized by different forms of representation to the point of confusing those representations with reality, you know, or our embodied being. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if on a deeper level, the, the fascination with the language as a philosophical issue has to do with, with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, you know, I don't really have a clear answer either. And I, you know, I've read Derrida and Foucault specifically, and, you know, I'm not, not, I haven't gotten, you know, <laughs> deep in the weeds with them, but I've read a handful of their stuff and have a good understanding. I think it's pretty dense stuff to read, but there's this notion that, you know, a lot of people talk about <clears throat> when you look at his, uh, philosophy or the history of philosophy in general, they talk a lot of, about a lot of ideas and concepts, right? You know, life, being, existence, the self, um, you know, all of these notions. And I think that with the postmodernist, it's more of, there is this focus on essentially the vehicle, right? The vehicle yeah. being language. It's like, okay, and we're trying to understand, how, we're trying to understand an experience, or we're trying to understand what somebody's really meaning, or what they're, mm -hmm. what they're experiencing, or what they're perceptions or their their realities are and the primary way is through language um as 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 homo sapiens it's not the only way and so there's always this kind of because i guess it's the primary way my thought was always they were just they got <laughs> kind of stuck on the primary vehicle right and that was it you know it's like if i say um you know the the bottle is on the table, right? Everyone knows what that means, right? We have mm -hmm. a certain structure. We have a certain script of what that is and what that isn't, right? By me telling you that through, you know, the five, six words I just said, you can understand what I'm saying. You know, I, I can't, it's very hard to explain that um, in other ways, right? And in some ways, if you go, if you go Wittgenstein, it's, you know, we create a picture, we create an image in our mind of the words mm -hmm. that are being said. And that's how we're mm -hmm. art, like anything. Um, and so that seems right. Yeah, it should, it should we sh if we're using, let's say 80%, you know, it's not a real number, but I'm just throwing it out there. If we're using 80% of communication between folks in our own species, well, shouldn't we spend some time focusing on uh, the major vehicle being late? Yeah. And yeah. so you can see the, um, I guess at the starting point, the utility and or importance of focusing on language. Yeah, so definitely. How does but, all of that start to track with how they kind of <laughs> unravel that? Well, let me, let me defer that question for a second and just acknowledge that 
I mean, there have been a lot of real benefits from this focus on language. Mm -hmm. And despite all of my, you know, at times fierce criticism of Derrida and Foucault and postmodernism and all of that, I mean, it does bring our attention to some really important things. I mean, um, a lot of what we take to be just given by the nature of things isn't necessarily given. I mean, if, if you know another language, you know that people just construe things differently depending on the language that they use. And, um, you know, focusing on language and more broadly speaking, focusing on culture does force you to sort of situate yourself and realize that what you think of as some sort of an absolute given or absolute truth is nevertheless um, construed in a language that's, you know, historical, it's contingent, it's specific to a particular um, culture, um, which is all valuable. I never want to undermine that value. But as I think you were alluding to in your question, then things get sort of reduced to that element. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's a great question. But I think that someone like Edmund Husserl was already sensing what was going on there. Because even in his time, and this is where phenomenology is kind of born with Husserl, is he could sense that there was like this weird split going on between this really sort of reductive scientism that just wanted to focus on objective truth on the one hand. And then on the other hand, there was this sort of equally reductive historicism that wanted to reduce everything to just, you know, the, the historic instantiation of an idea. Mm -hmm. And so phenomenology kind of steps in and to 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 try to bridge that gap Mm -hmm. um yeah yeah i yeah for for listeners um you know you know husserl was is the he's the the granddaddy of of phenomenology um and he was uh turn of the century to 20th century and his biggest work um i think it was being published or split in two parts and i think it's now published in one is um ideas which is um uh, i don't remember when that was published 1917 1913 somewhere in there that sounds right i could be wrong on that but um somewhere around there and so you know what brett is saying is is right is you know he's the whole construct of phenomenology is to try and say okay psychology you know at the time still very early on in in how we understand it today but you know as a as a science of reality right it's trying to understand and 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 depict things right and you can map that onto the natural sciences and maybe even some of the other social social sciences um but his his idea was you know kind of what you're saying is well we can we can explain things through objective truths, right? And we can have subjective ideas about those subjective truths, right? Um, you know, Heidegger later, you know, says like, you know, the <laughs> the objective is always subsumed under the subjective and vice versa, right? They all start to mm-hmm. kind of lie. Mm-hmm. And outside of that, or mm, I don't want to say outside of it, but kind of behind that or around that is the experience of something. And so phenom- or um Husserl was trying to explain a science of essence, right? You can tell me how it is. You can tell me what you think it is or how it is, but there's still something um, around that, which is the experience of it or what it is, which is, is not quite subjective, although we talk about it that way. And it's definitely not just objective. Um, And so it, it was, they were trying to, he was trying to understand that. And I think you're right. Is that there was this early kind of, premonition of you know what what deconstructionism would do later is you know how do we not just focus on some of these just very very particulars or you know kind of what the analytic philosophers do but how do we understand i guess the kind of gestalt of it right how do we understand all of that is kind of um this connective tissue with it and so Husserl is you know important for that way we'll, we'll come back to Husserl for for some of the other topics but so how does how does this focus with the con- deconstructionist with language um yeah everything we said is right you know okay it starts good 
we got to understand this vehicle of language. You know, what is it? What are we really saying? What is it that's really going on um, when we're connecting words with ideas or thoughts or values or principles between two people? And, you know, how do we further break that down? And so where, you know, so there's a lot of utility there, which you said, and I can definitely see that as well. Where does it start to go um, wrong or not wrong, but uh, where does it start to, to get interesting where, you know, you have some strong criticisms of? It starts to get interesting with uh, Ferdinand Saussure, the structuralist linguistic and more linguist rather, but more specifically with how people sort of misappropriate his work. Mm. So Saussure looked at language as a system in and of itself. And this was kind of revolutionary. So he looked at how one word refers to another and then refers to another mm -hmm. and started really looking at it in this very particular systematic way that was that was really new for its time. Mm -hmm. I mean, previously we had, you know, philologists who would like look at the, the history of a word and, you know, look up its, its Greek or Latin etymology. And but he was one of the first that really said, well, I'm going to leave all of that aside. I'm just going to look at language itself and I'm going to start to see how one word plays off another, plays off another and how we're able to somehow create meaning out of this out of this 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 intralinguistic play of words, you know, and made pretty cogent observations that, you know, the term black really doesn't have much meaning unless you have the term white. And, you know, up doesn't mean much unless you have the term down. And there's always, and if you, um, you know, put a word in a different context, well, all of a sudden it's, it's changing its meaning quite a bit. So there's this whole sort of intralinguistic context that really informs language in a way that we weren't aware of, mm -hmm. which is all very interesting and relevant and revolutionary for its time. But I think what happened, and, and so, you know, he was doing this and he kind of made this, um, this sort of, this decision in his, his methodology that he would just not look at how language refers to our sensate experience. It would, he wouldn't look at how language, like let's say the word cup actually refers to or hooks up with or relates to this, this middle or this ceramic object I have on my desk. And that was sort of just a, a decision he made because that allowed him to look at the aspect of language he wanted to look at. Right. Well, later philosophers, if I can call them that, people like Derrida and, and Foucault, mm -hmm. um, decided to kind of leave out that whole extra linguistic sphere of reference completely. Um, so that what you get is a sense that language is meaningful in and of itself and is in no way grounded on anything that might precede it. Now, I don't know if that sounds way too abstract for people. Maybe it does. But um, there is a huge difference, in my view, between saying that the terms uh, light and dark have meaning because they exist in a language system and we've learned the terms and light is the opposite of dark. And there's this, I mean, that's one aspect of it, but those terms also have meaning for me because I can look outside my window and I can see the light coming in and I can see the way it's playing upon the tree outside my window. And I have this immediate visceral experience that also informs the language. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole aspect that is left out in the sort of more reductive versions of postmodernism. And it's also the aspect that phenomenology is always coming back to. It's always talking about, you know, there's this, there's some sort of immediate primordial something that is informing our language mm -hmm. all the time. And it's always already there. 
Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you take the example, what you're saying, like, you know, when I look outside the window, right. And if I look outside my window, I see light. Well, <clears throat> that's what, that's what we are calling. We, we have assigned the word light. I'm sure we'll get into this in, in a little bit. You know, that is acting of sorts as a type of uh, a symbol, right? That's a, that's something that's representing what's happening, right? You know, for the sun to, you know, take the, you know, however long it takes is eight minutes, right, to reach the earth. And then I'm seeing it through my retinas and the whole thing, that whole process, right? That's more of the objective I'm, exp I'm explaining. Um, that whole process and then what's happening, we just use the heuristic through the vehicle of language that we give it a label that's called light, you know, or I'm seeing light. Right, right. And instead of just doing all of that, we just say, I look out the window, I see the light. It, it sounds like for the postmodern or for the deconstructionist, it's let's focus on the word light. And we're going to maybe initially not really think about context and what it's grounded in. And the mm -hmm. gestalt of it, we're just going to look yeah. at the word light. Yeah. What mm -hmm. is that? And then right. even further, we're just going to pick that apart, add yeah. vitamin. And then it's just like, okay, you know, here, you know, well, these are vowels and these are consonants. And then it's like, well, we're calling that a vowel and then we're calling that a consonant, but is it really there? And then, you know, it, it starts to, as the name, in, you know, kind of points out, it deconstructs the, the thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And and so then it, you know, at the end of the day, well, to me, you just have nothing, but <laughs> um, yeah. how do you, how do you understand kind of the further, you know, maybe, maybe just briefly or, or whatever, give us the arc of how, where does it end? Like, how does this all play out? So it starts with, okay, the words less somewhat devoid of context, uh, at least in comparison to the structuralism. And then where does it, you know, kind of, chart it out for us of how how the deconstructionists use this well it, you know it, it i think it ends in a lot of contradiction and paradox and disagreement mm -hmm. um and a perfect example of this might be in the work of jacques derrida and mm -hmm. a lot of people have said that derrida is a nihilist mm -hmm. um, you know because the very in the act of deconstructing everything you and deconstructing grounds you have no way of positing any sort of positive value or anything that's in in effect beyond deconstruction you know deconstruction can sort of in principle deconstruct itself mm -hmm. and you're left with nothing which is you know the red red meaning of the word nihilism it's right there in the nihil right um now, of course, he himself would deny this vehemently, um, and I think Foucault does as well, mm -hmm. and um, would say that actually, no, that's that's not the case at all. Um, in another way of thinking about this is that you know some people say that what Derrida does is to completely trap people within language so that, that, that there's nothing beyond it, that we're kind of in a, a prison house of language, yeah. that there's no, that there's no way of touching anything outside of this, uh, outside of it. And when, when, a, you know, when faced with this argument, Derrida would say, absolutely not. People have completely misunderstood what I'm saying. Actually, what I, what I'm saying is that it when you that when you really think it through, you're left with being utterly open, utterly open to that which exceeds our language. That's that's a it's a really interesting conundrum mm -hmm. that you arrive at when you deconstruct and can't do anything but that you're you're kind of left with um i think certain philosophical conundrums that that end up being irresolvable i'm not sure if that's a good answer but you know. yeah no the contradiction framing i think is right in that you know he's very upset or frustrated when people are misinterpreting him or or understanding mm -hmm. him there's a little bit of irony there 
It's like, well, yeah. you're spending all yeah. this time, man, telling us that the words don't matter within a frame or context. Yeah. And then you want to get mad that people misinterpret or understand what you're saying. It's like, mm-hmm. well, using your logic, how could they, right? The words don't really have yeah. meaning in some ways. Or, and mm-hmm. it's, it's like, okay. And then the, the funny thing about it is, it's like, you know, he's, you know, he wrote a bunch of stuff or Kuba wrote a bunch of stuff. I mean, they're doing so much. If <laughs> they care and do so much work just to say, none of it exists and doesn't matter. It's like, well, why would you spend all that time just picking things apart and deconstructing it? And so I never really got that. I was like, it's a lot of time, a lot of ink spilled just to say, yeah, none of it's there. I, I think I think the danger, I'll say with this, I'll, I'll say the danger, and then I'll say the, I guess, a, another positive about it. The danger with this is then where they, they, they put a certain valence on some things, I guess you could say, which is, they say, well, language doesn't, you, you tell me if I'm wrong on this, but language doesn't have, I don't say if it exists, but it doesn't have the meaning, the ways that we think it does. And, and when they pick it all apart, they say, well, we can't rely on language. So then we can't rely on dialogue because that's the way we're communicating primarily. With yeah. People, yeah. Right? So dialogue doesn't work. And yeah. if you're, if you're, if you're following along, that would, be sort of consistent with the logic of what they're saying, right? Look, yeah. here's the word, here it is in isolation. You know, it doesn't really exist, if you will, doesn't have meaning. Okay. So then when we're using a bunch of words and we're putting them together in sentences and we're putting them together in, in speech and dialogue, well, we can't, if we get to the parts of it and we can't trust it and we don't know it and it's not real, and you put all them together and scale it, well, it doesn't exists and it's not real so then when we're having dialogue with people we can't ever trust dialogue with people it no. doesn't work it falls apart no. yeah. and so then and then because of that there i think you scale this i'm kind of going backwards here but if you scale it even further up um then it's well no dialogue or very skeptical of dialogue okay so then it becomes well then reason and logic because that's what we're trying mm-hmm. to do with dialogue, primarily. Mm-hmm. We're trying to mm-hmm. use logic and reason within dialogue to try and understand things. And we're trying to yeah. get, get at things. And of course, it's, you know, language is always going to be inadequate in some ways. But we're, um, you know, we're trying to understand <laughs> the essence of things. And we're trying to get at things. And, you know, reason and logic all of a sudden are less instructive and less important Mm -hmm. and we can't rely on that so then it becomes okay then how and then you you scale this even further and you say well language is problematic dialogue is problematic logic and reason are problematic how do we have or how do we solve problems with other social primates in the world on this planet, if we're not able to do any of those things, we can't If the tools. There's this, there's this uh, skepticism or a pessimism on the tools we have to, to do things is basically how I see it and full of a bunch of contradictions. And so then the practical, uh, I guess, application of this, you know, obsession with language and tearing it all apart is, how do we apply it is, well, we just tear it all down from the structures. There is no structure. There is nothing. And then we can't use any of those things Mm -hmm. to make decisions and cohabitate well to solve problems or novel issues with each other. And we can't trust any of it. So then my question always is, how is that feasible? How does that work? Disregarding the other question of, is that really true i i i don't know if that really is true but you know those are two separate questions and so then it becomes you know maybe listeners or people can hear the danger of this right is Mm -hmm. if you follow it all the way practically how could we live in a society where we can't have language or we can't trust it we can't have dialogue you know so now we don't want dialogue yeah now Mm -hmm. we don't want logic and reason and we don't want all of these things how, what is, I mean, I can't see how that doesn't just promote chaos at some point, but 
Um, what, what are your thoughts, I guess, on how it all kind of plays out in terms of the practical implications? Well, I think you're right on target. And um, the thing is, dialogue becomes impossible because the the other is absolutely other. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's a sense in which in this almost almost fetishizing of the other and otherness, mm -hmm. um, people have made the other so foreign that there's there can be no common ground there can be no communication mm -hmm. you know because there can be no communion there's no community i mean mm -hmm. all of these notions are related right and um it's not i mean you're on target for a lot of different reasons i mean historically deconstruction has had a real antipathy towards empiricism mm -hmm towards empirical truths, and it has no way of explaining how empirical truths can come about um, because it dissociates itself from the very idea of experience, which, I mean, experience and empiricism are very, very closely related. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, you, and you can really see this playing out, I think, right now in, a, in our in our culture when you have people talking about things like um you know biological sex is just a construct mm -hmm. well we have these empirical sciences that have something very very different to tell us mm -hmm. very different and and we we have like certain empirical truths that we can test out over and over and over again and they tell us about certain differences between these two types of people and you know from this deconstructionist post-structuralist point of view in which language is in no way grounded in a phenomenal reality or an objective reality that is just hogwash that's not true and it's not grounded in empiricism and um Furthermore, if it's grounded in anything, it's it's grounded in power dynamics and oppression. And um, so you're getting at something very real that's playing out. And I guess I'm bringing in that aspect just because I feel like sometimes in talking about these really abstract ideas, language and reference and yada, 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 that... Um, I need to like ground it back in what's happening in the here and now, because despite the fact that a lot of people might not have ever heard of Derrida or Foucault or, you know, Merleau-Ponty, in some form, the ideas that they were working with are playing themselves out in real time. They're playing themselves out on Twitter. They're playing themselves out when I go to the supermarket. This is, <laughs> they have real implications. Yeah. Yeah, so I was gonna I was gonna get to the real life implications for sure uh, because I I I feel like mm, I think the the ideology and the genesis of some of the stuff that plays out is not emphasized or discussed enough, and you know people are you know, people just do that in general, but they're falling into these kind of camps, and it's very easy to be like, well, you know, why are you just you know, there's too many, there's too much uh, emphasis on uh, being woke or people that have a camp of being anti-woke now. And, and so it's like, yeah, okay. Like, you know, and people are, I think some people, they, there's a sort of sense of tribalism, right? Where it's like, yeah, that sounds good. And I like that. And so I'm going to just, you know, uh, tag on to what this guy's saying or this girl's saying. And, and okay, you know, we always do that. But I do think it's helpful for people to say to, to, with a with a spirit of criticism, right of of the ideas, um, but openness to see what is valuable in them, is to say, well, where do these ideas come from? They don't just mm -hmm. originate from out of the air. Yeah. And what's kind of the the history of that? So I, I agree with you. I think it's good to ground. Uh, before we do that, though, I did want to say one thing, one positive thing. I think about deconstructionism. Um, so I do think it can be helpful um definitely in the world of art mm. to 
in terms of process mm-hmm. to have a, a, a some in one's process, whether you're whatever medium of art, whether you're doing, um, you know, film or you're doing music or you're doing fine art or you're doing illustration or you're doing, um, you know, what, whatever medium to have a, a spirit of, oh, you know, okay, you know, here's a theme. How can I break this down? How can I deconstruct it to understand kind of the parts? Mm-hmm. And, and and then after that, there's something that can potentially come from that or how you want to move things around. Or yeah. all and I think mm-hmm. in terms of a process, in terms of a creative process, um, and sometimes I think you could maybe scale that elsewhere. I think that there's, you know, a charitable reading of this is saying like, you know, sometimes in our society, you know, we do things for a long time and we just go around and we do them. And it's like, you know what, maybe we need to sit down and we just need to break apart, you know, our tax code and see whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, you know, that sounds like a terribly miserable job to do and no one wants to do that. But no, I I think that there's some utility of some of the very elementary aspirational spirit of that stuff, right? Where it's, you know, we don't just rely on the structure and we just rely on the, you know, experience or the objectivity only. And, you know, you know, cause that's not human. I don't think exclusively. So I think that there's some, you know, I think it has a place maybe in terms of process for some things and there's maybe a spirit of it right but but i do think that's not what's happening (laughs) in in present day but i don't want to be too harsh on some of the utilities that some of that can have i don't think anyone would really disagree with that of right there's there's utility to that um what do you think about that real quick well this is exactly why i wanted to look at this question of you know linguistic reference which is at the heart of the deconstruction in terms of symptom and symbol, mm-hmm. because going into, you know, when I was thinking about the book, I knew that I had an axe to grind. I knew that I didn't like these guys. <laughs> I didn't like deconstruction and I didn't like Foucault. And, you know, here I am getting a PhD in psychology. And so I've got to be able to look at that and pull back from it and say, well, Okay, what's what's my transference to this this um, <laughs> yeah, theme? Yeah. And like, well, okay, and I didn't I didn't want to um, approach these issues just as yet another person who's going to attack the opposing view. Right. Um, right. I wanted I wanted to be able to think about it in such a way that would allow for that, that would allow for some critical thinking, but that would also allow. Um, me a way of seeing some sort of value or purpose in it. Because that's, I mean, when you're, especially if you're working within a Jungian framework, you know, thinking in terms of like symptom and symbol, symbol as Carl Jung would think about it. A symptom is simultaneously a, 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 a place that marks a, a pathology in the sense of like, okay, something's there's hurt here and there's something that's not working well. There's something that's in need of healing. So there's something that we could say is a little bit off, but at the same time, it has something of value and purpose in it. And in fact, the symptom is always working towards wholeness. So for him, you can't just disregard the symptom. You can't just throw it out. You don't want to just get rid of it. You want to Right. Find out what's important in it, what's of value in it, say yes to that, allow it to change your conscious perspective. Mm-hmm. And it, through that, the healing takes place. I mean, what one of the things he said was that, you know, you don't heal a neurosis, the mm-hmm. neurosis heals you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I really wanted to take that to heart when I was, you know, writing about deconstruction mm-hmm. and. And so, particularly in the later chapters of the book, I talk about, well, what is the purpose behind this? Um, Because it does allow us to um, take issue with, um, you know, sort of absolute truths that that we've been given that we don't take issue with. And so Mm -hmm. it does have purpose. It does have place. I'm not so much against deconstruction as much as I want to place it within a larger context and recognize that it's it's one moment in a process. It it highlights one aspect, you know, of of a relationship. Um yeah. 
So yeah. I, I love what you're what you're saying about it too. And I, yeah, yeah, no, no, that's great. No, and I think that that's the, I think that's the point of what we should do. We meaning you know, plural, we humans in in in, in society is look, I, I don't like postmodernism. I don't like deconstructionism. I don't like it on many, many, many fronts. I'm very critical of it. I, I think it's very pernicious and I, I don't like it. I, I, I'm very critical of it, you know? Um, <laughs> postmodern art, you know, there's, there's, you know, many people that are artists and I just, you know, every time we get to that part of the history or you can go into a museum, I'm just like, oh God, I roll my eyes. I'm just like, this is garbage, <laughs> you know? I just don't like it. It's not my affinity. Uh, um, yeah. You know? So, I mean, I'm, I have my strong opinions, right. But I, I don't, I can have my strong opinions and still say, Hey, let me take the time to be open and and, and to try and understand it, to try and see its utility, to see the certain positive components to it. How can it be used in terms of process? You know, nothing, I don't think is a hundred percent bad, you know, in that way. Mm -hmm, Right. mm -hmm. And so it's like, okay. You know, and I can, I think for much of the conversation, I've been trying to just do a very descriptive analysis, talk about some of the positives, um, and then show how it plays out. And then I think sometimes things can play out on their own to see their, their merits, right? Like we were detailing right. earlier. It's like, well, okay, well, if you can't, if, if you follow this through, which they would do, if we don't have, if we don't believe in empiricism, we don't believe in logic, we don't believe in dialogue, like that's just a bad idea. Like, I think mm-hmm. you can try that experiment out and see how far it gets you. It just, we can say, okay, you know what? That's not very good. Let's try and do an alternative way. And and that's kind of where I come at it from. It's not just an ax to grind because of, you know, whatever my transference is. It's more of, does this actually work? Does this promote right. efficacy or, mm-hmm. or well-being for people in a collective mm-hmm. society? Does yeah. does that work? And if it doesn't, then we need to scrap it. And do it. I would do that with any theory. So I, yeah. that's kind of my attitude of where I'm coming from. Anyway. Yeah, I love that. Um, it's it's a good attitude to take. Um, yeah, yeah. I want to I want to jump back to um, you started going in talking about the other, and I wanted to just jump on that and then jump on the. Um, you know, where they come with power and oppression, all that stuff, because that is prevalent. And then we can, we can string it to present day stuff um, and, and then switch gears. So how do they, so we talked about the language stuff and we talk about, okay, how does that all play out? Right. In terms of, um, uh, okay. Language. I don't know if they would say it doesn't exist, but we can't know it. Right. If we were just looking at the word cup or the word light, break it all apart, we do this, you know, syntax, we do all of this, you know, exegesis of it. And we realize there's nothing there, right? The, mm-hmm. the thing in of itself has no meaning, value, whatever. Okay. And then you scale mm-hmm. all that way up. So then they bring this other thing into it. Explain that. I know you talk about in the book and bring, bring, explain that. Um, so deconstruction we'll go back to that i mean there's this primary idea of what's called the transcendental signified this is from um, uh Foucault? no this is jacques derrida D- derrida excuse me yeah mm-hmm. and in the simplest of terms it's the idea that that language can never quite reach what it's trying to talk about mm-hmm. and so th- there's a sense in which whatever it's trying to address is always escaping in the grasp of language and and so from there it is understood that i mean the other is in a sense absolutely other anything i could possibly say about you would be uh, utterly um could never possibly in any way represent who you are Mm -hmm. and and um there's so there's this sort of i think overemphasis on an absolute transcendence or an absolute otherness mm-hmm. or an absolute disjunction mm-hmm. between um, self and other, between language and its other. There's, and, and I think the, the 
term absolute is very apropos. Mm -hmm. Absolute etymologically, I mean, it comes from the idea of a split and something Mm -hmm. is split off and it's absolute. And there is a tendency in a lot of postmodernism to have this sort of underlying absolutism so that, um, you know, I, I know we're going to talk about this this later, but it makes me think of a particular way in which people are conceiving of the notion of experience. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's sort of it's in, in sort of absolutist terms where, mm-hmm. you know, you're having an experience and I'm having an experience, but in no place does do do the does the twain meet. I mean, it's like they're absolutely an experience is inside you and experience is inside me. But there's no there's no middle ground. Mm-hmm. Um, there's I think another way of thinking about this is you know Jacques Derrida wrote uh, an essay later in life when he was talking about the experience of animals and like looking at his cat and what what and and you know the sense that the cat was just so absolutely other that he could not possibly imagine what it was experiencing now there's some value in thinking that way because there is this sort of just unfathomableness of other people and we do need to sometimes remember that people see things and experience things in ways that are radically different right but if you give an emphasis on that side of the equation and don't give any emphasis on the on the sense in which well, no, there also is an empathic relationship. There also is the uh, ability to identify with another person. There is also the fact that we can sort of share this, you know, perceptual sphere in which we can be perceiving things at the same time. And I can I can read your face and see, you know, get some sense of what what you're what you're living and 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 what it might be like to be you at a particular moment in time. I mean, we're always already implicated in all of these really deep relationships that we are, I would say, always predisposed to be able to perceive and make sense of. And a lot of the deconstruction just completely cuts that up in two. Um, In relationship of self and other, a lot of times is kind of reduced, and this is more in Foucault, kind of reduced to to power dynamics. Um, yeah, I was going to ask, how, how does that um, get inter- introduced here in terms of, uh, yeah, power? So, with, so you're making a distinction of there's the experience I have as who I am, right? My, the self, right? Which is yeah. terms loosely. And then there's the experience you have as the quote unquote other, right? So everybody, that, everybody and everything that is not the self is the other. And so yeah. in that way, I'm never going to know what you experience or what my cat experience is or what the tree experience is or whatever. So there always is the other. So then how does the power uh, and oppressive themes from from Foucault Prime. He he talks about I think probably the most. I think Derrida does too for sure. But how how does that come into play? Well, if you unground language from any sort of relationship in primary experience or objective reality, and if you say that any relationship that might it might have is fundamentally arbitrary, which is Kind of a misinterpretation of Sassur, but you know that's one that's become popularized. Then you're kind of left with the question of, well, how do we come up with these particular constructs? You know, how do we come up with particular ideas? And Foucault comes along and he says, well, you know, yeah, the relationship is fundamentally arbitrary, but it's also fundamentally motivated, and it's motivated by power. And so, you know, you can look at these historical systems of making meaning particular ideologies and really they're always a question of subjugating bodies, um, subjugating uh, and othering otherness. So he writes, uh, you know, the the madness and civilization and he, he describes mm-hmm. a whole process through which people who um, were considered crazy were, you know, put on to 
what a, what a ship of fools, you know, they were just like put on ships and like sent off into the ocean, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so re- the, for him, there's something in reason itself that wants to other and dominate anything that, that isn't, isn't within its purview. These are really good questions. I realize like, these are hard <laughs> ones to actually. Yeah. They're, 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 they're challenging. Yes. It, what, it's... What, so let me, let me turn the tables on you a little bit. Um, sure, sure, sure. Wait, where, what is that obsession with power and why, and why, why does, why do power dynamics come up so much in relation to these, these ideas? What do you think? Well, I think you were, you were right. I think um, the way my reading of it is twofold. Um, if, and I'm trying to read it accurately to their thought, you know, not imposing any other criticisms or thought from other people. If I understand them right, and, and again, not a scholar on Foku or anyone else, but the idea is that it goes back to, there's a sort of scaling up and an application that goes. So you, you were right, I think, in that, well, we understand everything through language. And if language is, is not really real and it does, it's not helpful and we shouldn't use it and we, we don't want all these things, how did many of the things within society become, right? How did they mm-hmm. get created? Well, mm-hmm. they were used through certain tools, namely language. So if the tools are bad, the systems are bad. There's a kind mm-hmm. of logical leap here that happens. And, and that way, you know, Foucault, the, my, well, I, was, I want to start with my criticism, but he, he, the, my reading of it is, is that he sees power always as tyrannical. It's always to, to almost as if they're synonymous terms. Now, maybe I'm wrong on that. Yeah. yeah. But it, power is always power over. It's, it's never it's, power with. It's never you know. right. It's not from within. It's not between. It's not. It's always over, and it's always negative. Right? There, there is an yeah. implicit, I guess you could say, maybe uh, negative uh, understanding of power, almost as if the word itself is negative. And again, it's some irony here with you know the emphasis on words, but the you know, and in in some ways. I mean, and, and let me be clear. I mean, power certainly has been and is, you know, pernicious and tyrannical and awful many times. I mean, no, without a doubt. <laughs> um, but it's not just that, right? right. Yeah. Okay, you want to use some of the reasoning. Whatever that experience is that people are trying to explain when they say power, whatever the word behind that is, or the meaning behind that word is, is... There's a there's a multiplicity of what that is, right? You can mm-hmm. have an intelligent, a smart, a kind power. You can have a power that is, um, you know, that is, I think, exploitative and non-exploitative, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's just different forms of trying to use different words or different dimensions or layers based on the various um, realities or experiences. But either way, for Foucault, it is, <clears throat> it goes back to he was very much against this structure of language. And so then he's, there's this leap of the creation of things, right? And so every creation of something that has some sense of structure is a, there's always an oppressor and the oppressed, right? Someone had to create it and rule it over people. And mm-hmm. that's not good, right? Because we understand the bits of it, the language itself, and then the systems in which, you know, were created through language. Um, are there and then there's you know th- then that whole enterprise is we need to not only deconstruct language but we have to deconstruct the system because it's yeah. it's, it's made by that language right and it's made by those things right that would be the i think the, the logic there and there's a couple of leaps there unless i'm misreading it but um and so in that way <clears throat> power and structure and, and in some sense, order, I think, but maybe not entirely, is seen as, um, you know, something to rule over with somebody. And, and then so then it, mm-hmm. so you, you couple this onto the other concept, which is mm-hmm. 
Well, other people are doing this to other people. And so we can't have that happen. And so we, it almost is like a kind of a flat kind of thing is the goal here is like, there shouldn't be any of these hierarchical structures, any of these power structures, because they are going to be in some sense oppressive, or they're going to be othering folks. And so I, I, what I tend to see with, with these um, guys, when they're not talking about language is, well, because of these systems that are um, very negative, you know, we have to deconstruct the power systems. And once we deconstruct it and everyone's kind of at, you know, uh, you know, kind of starting from zero again, Mm -hmm. then it can be, um, we start from zero and we see, you know, you see what happens, you can see what's going on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, again, right, just from what we know, with many things and about humans and what we know about society and what we know about biology and what we know about psychology, what we know about many things, even if you did that, there are going to be differences and there's going to be created hierarchies. I think if it's very clear and obvious from natural selection and how living organisms function on the planet, Mm -hmm. you go all the way down to fungi, you go all the way down to single cell organisms. You can go down to other animals. You can go to other mammals. You can go to other just different life organisms. There's always some sense of structure and order that's created. Yeah. I yeah. mean, that's, that's, a... that's a natural phenomenon, right? And so, mm-hmm. you know, <clears throat> you can definitely see this with other primates. I mean, for sure. I mean, you can see this with other social mammals, you know, orcas and dolphins, and they have a certain structure and a, a, a system of doing things, which can be negative sometimes and sometimes it can, cannot. And so right. then there's right. a, there becomes a point of emphasis on this, right? Which is, is it the system that is negative or is it individuals within the system that are negative? And, you know, sometimes it's, you know, a combination of both. Right. But um, so anyways, so I think that's where there becomes this kind of, again, fixation or rumination on power, oppression, the other. And it, it seems that their solutions are um, the groupings of things are more salient for them than the specific notions of, again, empiricism and reason, um, you know, because those are the master's tools or whatever. So then it becomes, okay, well, we just need groupings, which I I don't understand how that works either, because that breaks down, right? You know, if I'm never going to have someone else's experience, you know, how am I going to know that? And so then I think that's where there's certain groupings based on certain identifiers, right? And so I, I don't know how fully spelled out this is in all of their work, but um, I think there's some of the implications of that. So anyways, that's how my reading of it. What are your thoughts on some of this? It's, there are so many different directions I could, I could take this, you know. Um, there is, you know, a sense that in Foucault and Derrida that, I mean, there is no inherent order. There is right. no... right natural state of things. Um, There's nothing intrinsic, innate, or inherent. Um, And so, you can see this playing out. This might seem like a a weird shift, but, you know, if I'm thinking about power and this idea of power over, and I can see this playing out in a very interesting way in which we're talking about bodies. Now, there's a lot of talk about bodies recently and the way, you know, certain bodies are acted upon. And a lot of times it will be, you know, um, female bodies or bodies of people of color. But the same the same idea applies that, you know, there is power acting upon bodies. Mm -hmm. Now, this there's a huge difference between acting upon a body and acting upon a somebody. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. because a somebody implies a certain amount of agency. Mm-hmm. It, it, it it implies a certain amount of consciousness, awareness, ability to act. Whereas a body, I mean, technically, a corpse is a body, right? Mm-hmm. right. And so you get this image of like a certain. There's a certain passivity. So you have an active power working upon a passive body. 
Yes. And okay, that is at best one aspect of a, a very complex set of power dynamics, right? Because where where are the people there? I mean, there are no actual people or somebodies in either side of that equation. There's power, sort of disembodied power. What what is that? And then there's the well, there's there's the, these bodies. But nowhere are there actual people making decisions, um, and decisions motivated by needs, maybe needs that we could even understand as being innate, inherent, or intrinsic to the human condition. And so then from there, of course, you're not going to be able to you know, look at, for example, the, the types of things that you were talking about. We know, we just know that you know, animals, and we are animals, um, organize themselves into particular um, hierarchies and groupings, and they have particular types of relationships that we can talk about. And, you know, we know that these, the ways in which we, we organize cultures and which other animals organize their own cultures, because they have culture too, in some sense, um, is the result of something that goes far beyond this simplistic conception of, um, you know, power and oppression. You, you don't even have to go that far. You can, you can look at the order and hierarchy within our own body, as flawed as it is. Within our own body, you know, if I hit my knee on the side of, you know, the table and, you know, I feel some pain, the, the, the production that's happening in the, the neurochemicals and then all of the rest of our systems working in tandem together, there's a system where it goes, okay, all of the... Um, the pain suppressors and natural pain suppressors that we generate within our body go to the site of where the pain is to alleviate it. That's mm-hmm. a hierarchy. That's a system. You're not going to send that. If I hit my knee, yeah. I'm going to send it to my foot, which, which is totally fine, right? There's a natural process of doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, if you look at, you know, in the brain, right, you know, the stress cycle, um, I, I had a podcast with a colleague of mine that studies stress. There's a whole system. There's a whole way in which we very, through empiricism, know how that works, right? You know, it's mm-hmm. HCTH and then the cortisol, and then it goes to relaxation because it's exhausted and it's overwhelmed, and then it reboots. To go. We have those with, you don't even have to go, you can do it with, because of empiricism, I think you, ha, you can do, you can know that within, each person's own body at a physical level. Yeah. You know, so there was one point I was going to say about the active power versus the body and the somebody. I thought that was a very nice way in which you said it. There's a dissociative equanimity there. Yeah. You're dissociated yeah. on two points. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to pull away from this and say, like, well, this isn't here and this isn't here. It's like that that you you can't make or I mean you can, like you, you can ha- do or say these things. But it, it doesn't map onto the accuracy of many different dimensions of what we know or and or don't know. And so yeah. looking at it that way, as to make, again, absolutes really bother me. <laughs> I don't, I try to steer away from them. You know, absolutely saying that there are passive bodies and active systems, and then there's always mm-hmm. this top down approach. That certainly may happen in certain contexts with certain things in certain places, but that's not a uniformity. No. I mean, we just see that. Yeah. We see that yeah. everywhere. It, observationally, we see that, right? Right. Uh, and we can test that and know those things. And so, um, there, yeah, so the, there, there just becomes these not only, I wouldn't say disagreements, and I don't even think it's a difference of worldview. I just think it's an inaccuracy. And those are really important distinctions. (laughs) You know, there's no sense of reciprocity. There's no sense of symbiosis. There's Mm -hmm. nothing that I would call uh, an ecological Mm -hmm. uh, perspective. Ecological, not just in the the sort of reductive sense of just, you know, ecology and and the health of the planet, although definitely including (laughs) that. (laughs) Um, But in just in the sense of, an integral and intricate system of relationships mm-hmm. in which you cannot 
completely dissociate one thing from another and expect to understand it. Mm -hmm. You just can't. And um, I think, you know, um, the word dissociation is so apropos. Um, And I always like to think of these ideas in terms of dissociation, which is a term, you know, that we get from psychology. Yeah, it's a clinical term. But, um, and it's also important to, to just continually bring a lot of these abstract ideas back to that realm of the psyche um, mm-hmm. and say that, you know, when an idea seems contradictory, mm-hmm. a lot of times that's because on a deeper level, it's dissociative. There's yeah. like, there's a dissociation at, at work there. Right. Um, you know, I don't want to do that in a, in a like really um, like ad hominem sort of way and sure. you know, say that such and such a thinker was dissociating from their body, but <clears throat> there's certainly, um, it's certainly a good reading to, to, to bring up. Um, yeah. Yeah. So let's let's uh, let's sort of in the same universe, but let's uh, let's talk about. Um, and I, I promise we'll get to some. I do want to use some of the application stuff for current society because it's you know super super uh, prevalent. But um, let's talk about lived experience. <laughs> let's talk about lived experience. I love this. This is this is fun, you know. So I I um <laughs> okay um. Yeah. Oh, how do I want to organize this? So, okay, there's people that will use that currently in certain ways. And I think I have an understanding now, maybe I'm wrong, of basically <laughs> ironic. We're talking about this, but basically, people are talking using the same words to have different dimensions of meaning, right? Which is what most, most words and and phrases and and, and, uh, sentences have but lived experience does seem to be and how it's used currently in current society a it seems to be a bastardized version of an older idea that's been hijacked and namely from yeah from from, uh husserl um so i've i've said a little bit online i I can repeat it but uh, about my ideas of it so i'm curious to hear yours how do you um, what's your reading of lived experience, maybe in general, or, or if you're following Husserl, or how do you understand it, I guess, um, in, in, in one way? So as I understand it, it was originally coined by Husserl, and it was specifically to denote uh, pre-reflective as opposed to conceptualized experience. Um, and my sense is that, you know, that nuance, of course, has been completely lost. Mm-hmm. Um, which you, in part, can you explain the nuance in your in your way? So the pre-reflective versus the conceptual. Yeah, um, I don't know how deep in the weeds I want to go with this, but as um, deep as you want. <laughs> okay. So, if you really want to understand lived experience as Husserl understood it, I think you need to talk about the thickness of the present moment. Like Husserl had a very intricate, sophisticated analysis of time and time consciousness. Mm -hmm. And he did a lot of thinking about um, the present moment and how we can have uh, perceptions in the present moment. And one of the, the conclusions he came to is that, you know, the present is always... Uh, invested with the past and the future. And he used terms like protension and retention to talk about this. And protention is a little bit like, uh, you know, expectation, like what you're anticipating that what might happen, you know, in the future. And then retention is a little bit like, uh, you know, short-term memory or sort of a, a sense of what just happened. And he used these ideas to talk about um, the the perception of temporal objects like for example a melody like you really can't perceive a melody as a coherent whole 
unless you you have you know a sense of what just happened and you have an anticipation of what's about to happen, right? And he also used these ideas of pretension and retention to explain the perception of things like, uh, uh, you know, even the existence of this cup on my my desk. Well, there's something in me that allows me to not perceive it as a new cup each time I see it. It's not a dissociated perception. It's a perception that in, in some way is connected with my past and my future. So it it allows for sort of the the constancy of objects, object constancy. Now, all of this speaks to our lived experience and lived experience in the sense of something, you know, I'm not, I'm not perceiving the cup or the melody by way necessarily of having to put it into language or reflect upon it. This is something that's always already happening. Right. It's always already happening that I'm perceiving this, this temporal continuity, that I'm identifying things as existing through time. Mm-hmm. And in a, a lot of ways, lived experience speaks to this sort of, um, this way in which we are always already experiencing things before we even think about them before we even reflect upon them. Mm -hmm. Um, That is kind of in a nutshell what I have to say about it, but it's really interesting if you start to differentiate that understanding of how you identify things with a deconstructive approach (laughs) that is based on something entirely different. Yes. (laughs) Yes. It's very different. Um, I guess some of the questions I've got, and I don't know if I've answered it correctly or, or, or well per se, but some questions that people get, and I think it's just, you know, sometimes online or even just in conversation, it's hard to really have conversations at a certain depth. Um, if people haven't read Husserl, right. It's hard to, there's like a, there's a gap there. Right. And granted, Husserl is not easy reading. Um, Oh God, no. He's probably easier than maybe Derrida or Heidegger or, or folks like that. But um, yeah, he's, he's not easy to read. But some people will say, well, what's the lived piece? It's like, yeah, sure. We're experiencing yeah. it all the time. Like, what's this lived yeah. component to it? Like, that's weird. Like, that sounds like a tautology, blah, blah, blah. Like, right. like how, do you, how do you understand the lived piece of it? Well, yeah. I mean, people are, I mean, understandably, People point out, well, is an all experience lived? And yeah, sure. But he wanted a way of, you know, saying pre-reflective, you know, experience that is just simply lived and not reflected upon. Um, Now, I don't read German, so I don't know what the original term was. And I don't know if this could have been expressed differently. But I I know that Husserl laid it out fairly clearly of what he was he meant by that term, mm-hmm. um, and you know it's it's interesting because on the one hand you know who the hell reads Husserl very few people oh, only know. only crazy people like you and I <laughs> <laughs> and you know as I think I said before concepts creep and signifiers slide and you know words just they change their meaning over time. And um, so it's quite understandable that this, this term is being, you know, has been bastardized. Um, It's kind of no fault on this, on the people who are using the term, but um, it's very interesting the way the term is being used, because I think it still is sort of um, imbued with some of the kind of the ontological and epistemological heft that, you know, Mm -hmm. a a thinker like Husserl could grant to it, but it's being used by just anyone who wants to justify any particular opinion um, and say, it's my lived experience, you know, therefore it's it's irrefutable. And, and I think you were alluding to this earlier, there's a way in which that term is specifically being related to questions of identity Mm -hmm. that is really, really curious because you'll hear things like, um, you know, my lived experience as a a cishet white male is different from your experience as, you know, uh, 
female, person of color, non-binary, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And even that framing is so, I think, radically contradictory to what someone like Husserl would have meant, because the whole point of that is that lived experience is what you're living before you pull back and say, oh, I'm, I'm a cishet white male. Mm -hmm. And also, it's something that um, might call into question that there's anything that's called experience that could be associated with such a huge category like mm -hmm. that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's, there's an implication there, for example, that all people of a certain category are having a certain experience. So there's a sort of yeah. um, uh, false generalization mm -hmm. that's implicit there that I think is so, um, contra it so dramatically contradicts the very spirit of mm -hmm. phenomenology. Um, yes. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, I have a lot of a lot of thoughts on this point. Um, yeah. <laughs> I thought about it a lot, and I I just reread yeah. Ideas by Husserl, and I've been thinking about it, and I read a few other things by him, and so it's really trying, kind of like what you were saying in the beginning about like, um, you know, sometimes you know when you consider your own transference about certain objections to certain ideas, it's like, well, let me go and just consider this and look at it and. Mm -hmm. The, the yeah. origins of things. So I was like, well, I know. I mean, I've, I like Husserl a lot, and so I've read um, a lot of his stuff before, and I hadn't read it in a while, and it was a also a good excuse for you know class prep and stuff like that. So I said, oh, okay, mm -hmm. good. <laughs> um, yeah. So I agree with everything you say uh, about uh, lived experience, and you said it really well. Um, not to be redundant, but maybe to. You know, listeners can get it a second time from a different perspective. Um, yeah, is, yeah, no, please do. Is you're, um, you're really good at explaining these things, by the way. I can tell that you're a teacher. Like you, <laughs> you, you break it down. <laughs> oh, that's well. good. Uh, that's good. I yeah. hope so. <laughs> Hopefully, my students think that. Um, so, yeah. So, like lived experience for Husserl. There's a few particulars there that I think there's. Well, I I just think it would. It's weird. He didn't write about it this way. Maybe, or maybe he did, and I haven't read it, but that was how it is now, or how it's you that word is used now, that phrase used now, is not what I think a, appropriate reading of Husserl. So maybe they're describing something and they're just using the wrong words or, or something like that. And so there's no kind of counters to that. But based on the reading of Husserl, yes, there's this the pre reflective thing is true, right? And that. Um, he's he's trying to explain. So all phenomenology is is to to the things themselves. It's a descriptive right. analysis of experience, right? You're just trying to describe and explain experience, not so not the objective, not the subjective, right? So I can tell you that you know um, I went to the store. And then I, you know, I walked down the hill and then I opened the door. I, I, that's an objective, somewhat subjective. It goes back to the Heidegger point. But there, I can tell you the objective things about what's happening, right? Mm -hmm. I can give you the subjective piece, right? Which is more of how I felt about it, what I was doing, what I was thinking, kind of the, you know, more of the, the things I'm trying to intimate in that kind of experience, right? It's not just the newspaper that I'm reading, right? There's like my perspective. Mm -hmm. Before that, and sort of around that, is um, moving through the world of that experience. So, it, so it's, it's happening before it happens in some ways. So another way of saying that is, basically, there are things you can't explain, but that are happening uh, objectively, subjectively, right? And so that's what phenomenologists are trying to do. If we don't have the objective or subjective dichotomy of trying to explain experience, well, what do you have? Well, you have at the very least descriptors. And so this is where Husserl will talk about this notion of bracketing, right? Where you kind of bracket those objective, subjective mm -hmm. ideas or, or, or ways of viewing it. And so it's another lens, right? And it really does map onto, for example, I can explain... Um, I can explain that I'm sitting here in this room, right? And I'm sitting in a chair and my feet are on the floor and 
you know, there's sort of a mindfulness meditative co- component to it, you know, and I, I can explain everything that's going on. What are the dimensions of the room, the physical things that are in the room? I can tell you how I'm feeling. You know, I can tell you what's going on. But there's before all of that, what it is to be just in the room. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like it's just, if I just don't, if I kind of turn the objective, subjective stuff off as best I can, there's something active that's there. And it's hard to explain, right? This is why, hey, if you read the phenomenologists, like it's just painful to read because they're trying to explain something super, super abstract. So the lived experience piece for Husserl was this. What is the just being there in the present that's happening? Like, what is, mm-hmm. what is this pre-reflective idea that's happening before you to try to describe it objectively or subjectively? If you didn't have that language or that network of ways of explaining things, there is something that is there, yeah. right? Because otherwise you wouldn't exist if you weren't there. So hence, you know, existence, you know, precedes essence, right? This is not the... Well, I'm going to tell you about the quality of the experience. I'm going to tell you the, you know, kind of the nuance of certain things that comes later. And so with lived experience, there is this temporality component of it, which is there is one moment that is happening. So the moment right now is contextual with what the moments I just had before that and what's going Mm -hmm. to happen after that. Mm -hmm. This is, this is one of the really interesting things. There's some nuance with it, but Husserl, Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, Jean-Paul Sartre, they all kind of talk about time in the same way, which is fascinating mm-hmm. to have that much continuity between very different thinkers from different times and different countries. But they all see time as, in essence, a singularity here. And so therefore, it doesn't really exist in the ways we think about it, right? It, we, it's a useful structure objectively, but there's this <laughs> thing of, well, the, there is the present, right? And so the, the future is wrapped up in the present and the past is also folded up in the present and every time you're accessing your past or thinking about the future you're unraveling or unfolding it in that present moment so it's always living right and that's not just predicated on memories right because you can still have they're necessary objectively but you have to have the experience of it all over again if i think about someone that's died i can tell you objectively what happened i can tell you how i feel but there's the experience of that again of all, kind of all over again sometimes again not the same way and all that, but there's a small bit of that. And so they always think about time in terms of flow, right? That there's, and that's not unique to phenomenologists. There's Eastern folks that think this way too, which I think is right, is there's, there's a flow of time. And so you have to understand it in that, or, you know, Husserl will say you understand it that way to try and say that active participation in the pre-experience of what's going to happen or how I explain it is the lived part of it. Now, all of that to say, right, it's very important. No, and no, because phenomenology is descriptive, he's not trying to associate a positive or negative valence. There's no value judgment placed here. There's no attribution per se. There's no, um, um, uh, more morality that's infused here. He's just trying to describe it. He's just trying to explain what's going on. And so there's that piece, but, and there's no, as far as I can read it, generalizability. Now that's not to say that this doesn't happen with every other person. As far as we know, the point he's trying to say is he's trying to look at it within being itself, right? Within the ontology of someone exclusively. So he's, he's not saying this translates to, or the, this generalizes to everybody, and or that there is a, a value that's there, that this, quote unquote, in his terms, lived experience is superior to someone else, or because of a certain uh, taxonomy you place, a certain grouping, that everybody in this situation is going to have a similar experience. Right. Describing the experience with the individual. now. You can branch out from that and say, well, you can make some uh, deduction, I guess, of, well, if this happens and this happens and this happens, maybe it could happen and happen and happen and happen for this person, this person, this person based on certain criteria. And the biggest, the most charitable view of that, if you're staying true to Husserl, is maybe, sure, potentially, there's a possibility, but you don't know for sure. 
And in fact, I would think that you, most times you don't. And so a, a, a grouping of sorts of lived experiences, you know, as an example, if I'm a Hispanic male, then all Hispanic males or many Hispanic males are going to have a similar lived experience. Or because I have my mm-hmm. lived experience of a Hispanic male, I know what, you know, uh, Marco or Jose or Jorge is going to, uh, yeah. is going to feel as well. <laughs> it doesn't, that, oh. that doesn't happen. That's not, that's not who Sorol's lived experience. Right. So, sorry, that was a very long tangent. Sorry about that. But <laughs> all of that to say, how do you understand? Um, and I'm sort of kind of, uh, it's ambiguous or unclear to me still how people currently use that term. So the how people currently use it, um, lived experience seems seems to be very different than than how Husserl meant it. How do you understand it? I guess generally. How do I understand it regards to how Husserl was using it, or how no, no, it's no. being used how it's being now? used? Yep, yep, yep. How it's being used now? Well, you know, I. Tweeted, I've tweeted a bit about this, and it's been really interesting to see the responses I get. Because sometimes mm-hmm. you, you know, you tweet something out and you think that you know you're gonna get one like because who's gonna know what the hell you're talking about? Right. And then you and get like, time, you get ratioed, you get like a thousand likes. <laughs> yeah. And I tweeted out something along the lines of there is something very autoerotic about the way in which the term lived experience is being used. Yeah, I saw this, yeah. And I think what I meant by that is that it sounds We can't, Brett, we can't know what you meant because language is inadequate. (laughs) We don't know what you meant. The language is is garbage. (laughs) Well, you know, I'll I'll, I'll just uh, talk at these images on a screen and pretend that there's an actual person there that might... (laughs) <laughs> have some some clue you know what um, do you mean by autoerotic i'm assuming that probably piqued people's interest yeah in fact i think i got i got picked up by some some activist who did a screenshot of the of the tweet and didn't like it and Uh-oh. got embroiled in a minor controversy Uh-oh. um yeah but whatever that's all good um so to begin with, I think what I'm hearing in the way people are living, they're using lived experience is that they're talking about something that is um, something that is so deeply enclosed within their subjectivity. And oftentimes it, it feels as if they're almost ex- really experiencing an image of themselves Mm -hmm. and then saying this is my this is who i am this is my my bedrock experience almost as if like i'm imagining myself and imagining others and imagining a relationship but it's all taking place as imagined, like within myself in sort of this autoerotic way, whereas, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, experience, and I think you were kind of alluding to this in your own way, is experience, as as some people try to understand it, is what breaks through the subjectivity. It's kind of what what breaks the Mm subject-object dichotomy. Mm -hmm. And you can't experience, experience always means that you're experiencing something. And mm-hmm. this kind of gives the sense that, well, people are experiencing something within themselves and then calling that experience. It's, 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 I don't, I don't quite have a handle on it, but I was surprised at the huge amount of like likes I got for me, at least, you know, of like people are like, yeah, yeah. And so there was just that, that sense of autoeroticism, mm-hmm. um, almost like, like a, like a sort of introversion that just compounded upon itself. Um, mm-hmm. You know, in, in my understanding of the word experience, I can, I can use it and say things to you in such a way that you'll, you'll have some sense of what I'm talking about. And the way in which it's being used now, it's just like, 
Mm-hmm. No, it's something so precious, so individual, and and also therefore beyond reproach, beyond challenge, beyond being questioned. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I can say, well, my lived experience is that I'm sexually attracted to trees. Um, mm-hmm. And there's actually been some tweets about this. There's like a name for it now. Yeah. Like, yeah. A, yeah. I don't know what it is, a boro sexuality or something like that. And it's, you can't like kind of ask, well, what, what is that? And how does that play, play itself out in the real world? And like, mm-hmm. what do you mean? And mm-hmm. I'm not sure if that makes sense, but yeah. Yeah, no, it does. I, I, um, you reminded me that Husserl talked about experience in just that. It's the, again, pre-reflective, meaning it's not objective subjective. And I feel like that's what a lot of people do all the time. They talk about lived experience as an object mm-hmm. or as a subject. And that's yeah. fine. That it, again, to, let me clarify something. Husserl and all the phenomenologists, Merleau Ponty, they never, they never, when they might have, you know, some criticisms of that stuff, but they're never saying we shouldn't have that. Right. right. Or that it doesn't happen or that it's not, very purposeful right mm-hmm. of course we should have objective reason in the scientific method and we should have understanding of subjective feelings about certain states and like of course absolutely a hundred percent they're all saying that i'm saying that you're saying that the point though is is that there's something else that how do we understand what we to, to describe things and yeah. if you're using lived experience in an objective or subjective way that's fine. You can do that, but that's not what the term means, at least by right. Husserl or how it's originated. You're, you're maybe talking yeah. about something else, but yeah. it's not a lived experience. Right. And it's not, right. and it's, it's inaccurate. And so maybe you just need another term for it or something like that's fine, but um, it's, it's not that. And you're right. There is this kind of like lockbox function of like, well, that's why I lived experience. You can't say anything about it. It's like, um, that's not what well, that, again, you're talking about something else and be, of course you could. I will say that I follow Heidegger on this with, you know, I'll share, I've talked about it before. I'll share the, or, or save the whole, you know, Dasein approach, right? Dasein is existence for humans essentially. Right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he always said, it's always possessive. It's always your own. You don't have somebody else's experience, but you do have yours, right? You cannot try to export your quote unquote lived experience with other people based on a immutable trait you can but you're just gonna have a lot of inaccuracies right so the fact that you and i are both male like sure there are some things that are true based biologically objectively true and maybe even Mm something but experientially i'm not you (laughs) i don't have i don't have your experience i don't have your your being um and so I think the lived experience thing does become like this, um, you know, very, 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 very like precious, you know, commodity in a locked box. And if you say anything about it, then, you know, um, you are, um, you, you can be treated or viewed very negatively about that. And um, again, I think there's definitely certain occasions where if people are very very negative or they're coming out very hostile or antagonistic sure but i mean i think that there's just the essence of that alone or the aspect of that alone i just think that there's a lot of inaccuracies in how it's used now and um, at the very best i think it should be something uh another term maybe uh, used to describe that two two things i want to respond with that is um you know one of the ways that helps me think of lived experience is just this phrase and it's it's straight from surly he says that you know the term lived experience is it's it refers to what is pre-given to the eye so Mm -hmm. there's a sense in which it's pre-subjective it's it's and that the second point i wanted to make is that I mean, you're right in terms of the phenomenologists. They're not saying that, you know, the subject-object dichotomy in and of itself is wrong. Mm -hmm. But they're trying, but I think they're trying to transcend that dichotomy by saying both and. Yeah. Right. And um, 
if we if we get into Merleau Ponty, I think he has some fascinating ways. I was I was of just doing that. I was just going to do that. Um, <clears throat> I'll say this, um, Merleau Ponty. So I'm going to make a bold statement. Okay, I'm ready. Maybe not to you, but <laughs> every psychologist and every psychology student should read and know the philosophy of Merleau Ponty. Yeah. Uh, full stop. hundred percent. He yeah. is so, so, so helpful and instructive. Mm. Um, maybe, so we've been talking, we've been hitting a lot of subjects here thus far. And um, maybe you want to give just kind of like the, the overview of not really him per se, but just kind of his, his contribution in this whole uh, phenomenology discussion. So, uh, let's see. The cart, you know, we we've hear, heard. I think most people, a lot of people, have heard of the Cartesian split. Hmm. You know, there's this um, split between the race extensa and the race cogitans, basically between mind and matter. And a lot of philosophy has been really trying to work through that. And we've already spoken about it in terms of like a split between subject and object. Yeah. Um, and so Descartes' quest for absolute certainty resulted in an ontological split. Um, and it, it resulted in different attempts to either ground absolute certainty in, in the subject or in the object. And I think Merleau-Ponty was very, very adept at seeing where certain philosophies decided to ground everything in the subject or in the object, or to use his terms, and the terms he uses a lot in phenomenology of perception is, you know, there we have this one stream of thinking that's intellectualism, and then the other stream of thinking, which is empiricism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're sort of loosely associated with, you know, um, different sides of a binary. So intellectualism, you know, is you, you could associate it with nominalism, mind, subject, certain transcendentalism, race cogitans, or being for itself. And then on the other side of the equation, you know, um, you know and empiricism, it's more like this, uh, you know, realism, matter, object, race extensa, being, right in itself. And so you've got this, the, this fundamental dichotomy. Now, what I think he did, and he doesn't say this, this is my reading, but I think what he was able to do was basically take this basic idea of, of the perceptual unit of a histalt, right? Which is always made up of foreground mm -hmm. and background, mm -hmm. theme and horizon. And in effect, say, oh, this side that I'll call intellectualism is always putting in the foreground the mind, the subject, mm -hmm. um, in some cases, nomina, names, language. Yeah. And then, but there's always something implicit in the background there. There's mm -hmm. all the object, the, the opposite is always implicit in the background. Mm -hmm. And he saw that the other side of the equation, empiricism, is always putting in the foreground object, matter, um, you know, realism, being in itself. And I think he saw that, well, God, they're, they're always part of, of a perceptual whole, right? I mean, the, the foreground and the background, the, the, the mind and the matter, the subject and the object. But... Because he was an empirical psychologist, an empiricist in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. he was actually able to see kind of in real time, so to speak, how that could play itself out by really thinking through perception itself, mm -hmm. both, both healthy perception yep. and anomalies in perception. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, you know, I think one of the things he realized is when you're thinking through perception and not just kind of in this abstracted sense, like I think you get with Husserl, but in this very embodied sense, you know, mm -hmm. is that 
perception is always partial. And is, there's always a very complex interplay of imminence and transcendence. Right. So if I'm looking at a book, I can see one side of the book and I can't see the other. So there's always an element of it that's imminent and an element that's transcendent. Mm -hmm. And the error in a lot of philosophy up to date in its search for absolute certainty was to um, kind of miss that fact. It's like you're not going to get absolute certainty for the same reason you're not going to be able to view a book from all angles at once. Mm -hmm. that, that's just there. That implies a certain atemporal perspective that we can only arrive at through picking up the book and turning it around and looking at it from different perspectives. But yeah, fascinating. And I, and I don't know if I've gone on too long, but I think in particular in his later works, um, like the visible and the invisible and the mm -hmm. prose of the world, mm -hmm you can really see how he's just thinking this through in such a, for me, like a fundamentally different way where it's, he's no longer thinking about object and consciousness. He's really there with his hand, one hand touching the other and contemplating the fact that, Oh, the hand that touches is also always already touched. And when my two hands are touching, I can't, there's an interplay. There's an entwinement there that's so intimate and that this entwinement I can see at work in everything around me, mm -hmm. including the relationship of language and perception between presentation and representation. Mm -hmm. And I love it because he ends up in a place that sounds so simultaneously, and this is a hard one to pull off, sensual, mystical, and reasonable at the same time. Yes. Like, holy, holy shit. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. He's <clears throat> super underrated. He gets missed a lot in conversation. Wow. Yeah, so I, that was great. How you, how you, how the overview of that was very nice. Um, I, I'll say the biggest thing with him that really... You know, not initially, um, but as I kept reading him, I, I, I really just saw the power of the thought and really mm -hmm. latched onto it was, so, so <clears throat> yeah, Husserl's really abstract. He's kind of the first, he's, you know, really important. Heidegger was doing a whole big new system of ontology and he was brilliant. I love Heidegger. Um, Nietzsche is not a phenomenologist per se, but you know, his ideas are always looming over all these people. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> but with Merleau Ponty and, and Sartre is cool too, for some of his emotion stuff. I like Sartre on, um, negation and nothingness. Actually, I think he's pretty solid. Um, I don't <laughs> like it for existential psychoanalysis things, you know, it, it's, there's, there's criticisms I have of him and then there's all the political stuff I'm critical of too, but he, right. um, with Merleau Ponty, the biggest contribution that was just like, once you read it and you get it, you're like, how did I, how, how can you not see it this way? How do you miss mm -hmm. this? Mm -hmm. So when you take phenomenology, right, the things themselves, describing experience, all that good stuff, okay. And then you, you're, you're trying to explain what all that is. So there's a lot of conversation about time and space. And there's a lot of very abstraction of what being is and who it is to be and all that. Mm -hmm. and Merleau Ponty just says, you don't have any of that unless it's through the body. Yeah. That mm -hmm. is the, like he centers yep. everything around through the body. Now he's not making a value statement, right? He's not positing value per se, but he's saying that is the first and last, if you will, conduit of understanding yeah. that. And so he's, mm -hmm. he's spending all of much of his time, I mean, the big work, which um, is amazing, is the phenomenology of perception. You know, how do we explain the experience of perceiving? Mm -hmm. And and so he will explain that through um, attention and sensing, and he explains it through space, and he explains it through time, and he explains it through all of these modes. But he's always talking about it through how it's embodied. Because in his view, if I read it right, is 
if I was able to upload my consciousness to a computer or something, it still wouldn't be me. Yeah. I need the body. And so there is yeah. what it's super interesting. I know later Merlin Ponti really kind of what you were explaining with the hands and stuff is, is nice. But he was just talking about how what happens when you have a perception or you have an ex, a, you know this kind of pre-reflective experience when it gets translated through the body. There's these processes and how these things happen. And and so and so this I think is where he gives some kind of um framing of there's basically three parts he creates. So just like you said, there's foreground, background, but then there's you, right? You're the third part of that piece. Oh. Right? There's you where it's there. So for example, if I see um, you know, the cup here on the table. Uh, but there's a background of the table back uh, behind it and then the walls and then within context, right? Again, the whole gestalt of things. But there, you need me to mm -hmm. place all of that in a frame, right? You, my being is setting this and it's through, and then, you know, he talks a lot about vision and he gets very physiological in some of these components of how do you understand the experience or how do you understand the details? and. I, I one of the things I'm still not quite. I, I need more reading of him, and maybe reading about him. But he has this very maybe you maybe you can explain some if you know is. He has this. He's doing something different than psychology is doing, but he doesn't dislike psychology. He values it, mm -hmm. but he's mm -hmm. making a claim, or he's making claims that what he's doing is different than that. There is the kind of just the scholastic academic kind of infighting of like, you know, phenomenologists were always like, you know, with behaviorism and with psychology, like, no, 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 no. You guys don't get to do this. We have to still say how philosophy is still the, the, the king of the, the hill here. Um, right. So there's a little bit of that kind of stuff that kind of comes through a little bit, but he has a deep respect for psychology um, and he talks about it, but he is trying to make the distinction of how what he is doing is different. And this is where he will talk about, psychologists are always um, fascinated or, or, or concerned about memory or they're concerned about representation and what he's doing is not quite that it's a little bit different. And so how do you yeah. think about that? Well, what comes to mind as you're saying that is that he was simultaneously influenced by Husserl and then also trying to break out of that. And the mm -hmm. big, um, the big critique of Husserl is that he's grounding everything within imminence. Yeah. So this thing called, you know, the transcendental subjectivity, transcendental ego, and everything somehow taking place within that. And mm -hmm. Husserl was also trying to differentiate himself from psychology. Um, and so, you know, you put Merleau-Ponty within that framework, um, and he's trying to make that same differentiation. In the same, in a strange way, Jung was too, which is interesting because he was a psychologist. Mm -hmm. They're trying to, it, it all goes back to trying to break through that subject object divide. And the importance of the body cannot be overstated, as far yes. as I'm concerned. I'm, I'm 100% with you on this. Because the body simultaneously poses and I think resolves a whole bunch of philosophical issues that have been sort of plaguing the West for mm -hmm. many, many centuries. And that's because the body is both subject and object. That's right. Simultaneously. Right. Always at the same time. They're working basically yeah. laterally, uh, moving through time and space, again, laterally, simultaneously. It's like this is happening concurrently, right? Yeah. yeah. Which is fascinating. Think about it. Though. Right. So, um, forgot, kind of forgot where I wanted to go with this. But so when, when you start thinking through that, then all of a sudden, you know, the whole idea that there's a subjectivity or a psyche within someone starts to become a little bit just too mired in paradox. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think Jung also, in his own way, was thinking that through. And I don't think... Jung, God bless him, um, you know, um, my, my primary mentor in life, but he didn't have the philosophical mind that 
um, Merleau-Ponty did. He didn't have the training and he wasn't a systematic thinker in the same way Merleau-Ponty was. I think he was a you know intuitive genius and did a whole bunch of other great things. Mm-hmm. But having said that, um, so but in, in his own way, he was also trying to break through that and say, look at what I'm calling the psyche is not within you. Psyche, you are within it. It is the it is the the uh, sphere in which you are walking right now. It is everywhere, and, and psyche is first and foremost relationship. In fact, in psychological types, which is the most read of his books outside of memory, dreams, and reflections, a man and his symbols, which are the sort of the popularized book that are relatively accessible. Mm-hmm. But in psychological types, he specifically says that he is construing his psychology as an attempt to overcome the two poles that could be described as esse in intellectu and esse in re, which basically map on perfectly to what Merleau Ponty was talking about intellectualism and empiricism. Right. Now, Merleau Ponty's kind of middle term that attempts to kind of transcend these opposites could, you know, we could say that it's perception, it's phenomena, it's the body. Um, we could also say it's reversibility or that it's, um, you know, the chiasm. There's a lot of different terms he uses. For Jung, it's anima, mm-hmm. um, which means soul. Mm-hmm. And he saw that as being like the the term that would help him overcome this fierce division between mind and matter and subject and object. But I think as he went on, he started to see that, you know, he was still kind of conceiving of psyche as being very much internal and associated with the subject. And so he kept on trying to come up with new new ways of thinking about it. And that's when he starts th- talking about things like synchronicity. Mm-hmm. And he talks about something called the psychoid, which he says is like right between matter mm-hmm. and um, what we call psyche and sort of relating the two. Um, yeah, I don't even know what what question prompted this. I can <laughs> no, just okay. go That's off okay. on this stuff. <laughs> no, no, geek out. No, it's, like, it's fine. No, it's great. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that there's Merleau Ponty's balancing of, of this stuff is, and especially through the body, it does map on to kind of what kind of what Jung was 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 also doing as well. I'll just say one thing before we, we move from Merleau Ponty to, to Jung is Merleau Ponty was also <laughs> very interested in and in how Again, there's the gestalt of things, right? But then also, how does it fit? So I had mentioned earlier, you know, he kind of sees time the same way, this flow and, and how it's all moving. But, you know, he has this piece of talking about, you know, how do you move or how does someone have the body in space, right? Which is yeah. very fascinating to me. and. Yeah. Because it's, you know, space is a, you know, I sometimes ask students, students this, I'm like, you know, what is you know, what is space? You know, it's very, there's no way, you know, you can't really objectively answer it. It's very hard. It's the nothing mm-hmm. that's there, but you know, it's like, you know, it's not right. there, right? You know, it's a very hard thing to kind of concretely put in. But, you know, he, Merleau Ponty was always somebody that, in terms of space, would say how, he would say we are of space and within space. Mm-hmm. In fact, you put some aspect of, you know, through the body, I think, because the perceptions are coming out through the body, you place yourself in space, right? So that way, it's one of those things where, you know, if you, if you, if you come into my house, you know, someone lives here, right? This kind of goes back to your, um, is it a body and somebody kind of distinction? Mm-hmm. You know, a, someone lives here, right? But how I, let's say organize you and manipulate the space is from my being. This kind of goes back to the background foreground being kind of thing. And so, you know, I put 
the I put the couch this way, I put the TV wow. this way, I hang these pictures and these artifacts, and I in this certain manner. Mm-hmm. That is from a a psyche, a, a a human being doing that in a very in a way, right? That it is happening in a way, and in that way, we inhabit space. Space isn't only a objective entity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, it is something where you are connected, and when you when you see it that way, this is why people have this. Maybe it makes sense intuitively. With people is, you know, if somebody, um, how can I say this? Have you seen the movie Following by uh, Chris Nolan? It was his first no. film. It's a black no. and white film noir. It's like eighty minutes. The premise of the movie is there's a twist, like every Chris Nolan <laughs> film has. But the, the basic premise in the beginning is that there's just basically this guy and, you know, he, you know, he, he doesn't know what he's doing with his life. And he bumps into this other guy that does these kind of breaking and entering types of things. So he pairs up with them. They're kind of like a duo. It's all philosophical, right? And he goes, <clears throat> we're going to break in. And he, he kind of shows him his method, right? How they, you know, how he breaks into people's houses when they're at home. He'll follow them, he'll watch them, and then he'll figure out their pattern, and then he'll break in when they're not there. Mm-hmm. So the first time they do it, the guy starts trying to take all the stuff, you know, take the cash and take, you know, valuables and jewelry. And the guy says, No, no, no. We I mean we can do that, but I don't really want to do that. He says, the other guy, the new guy says, well, why? He goes, well, because I just want to see their response to being in their space. And he goes, you, you show them what they have, and then you take it away. Right? And it's this very weird, cryptic way of saying, you know, so he'll put like someone else's, like some, something he got from another house in this person's uh, dresser, you know, a pair of socks or an underwear or something, right? That's mm-hmm. not theirs. Or they, you know, flip all their pictures upside down. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, wow. <clears throat> you know, or something like that, or take something very valuable, something very um, um, valuable, not monetarily, but in terms of um, memories, you know, maybe a, something that's like a, uh, memorabilia of a trip or something like that. And so, and then go and watch, you know, from another building or something, their reactions. In the same way, if, so if someone places themselves in that position, the reason that registers is because the things in of, them, of themselves don't mean anything. Mm-hmm. The pictures, the objects, yeah. they have no inherent meaning necessarily. Right. <clears throat> it's the memories you attach to them. It's the experience yeah. you have in them. Yeah. Much less. And then when you can deduct from that, there was somebody in my space that wasn't allowed to be in, or I didn't know that they were in and they were in, you know, and then there's the, all the doubts and the wonder of all the other things that could have happened. Did they take something else? Did they put something somewhere? Am I going to find something out? There's just too many, there's too much ambiguity. And all of that to say, why does that matter? Who cares? Mm -hmm. It's it's just a room, right? It's just a house. Yeah. Just space. Who cares? And and, and so for Merleau Ponty is we inhabit space. We are, we become of the space, yeah. right? And it is connected with our being. Mm-hmm. And those things, that experience of that has such a, an important essence to it. We place the value and essence into yeah. that space. And, and, and there is a, you know, and he will talk about that and then how it's, we know and see, you know, perceive those things through um, kind of the body. And so, and we have all these other little ways of doing that that we don't realize, but we have this kind of instinctual or visceral reaction when mm-hmm. something is defiled or desecrated because it's we, we place the meaning and the value into something from with our being. And so in that way, I think there's a type of, in some ways, we're externalizing 
elements of ourselves within the space. And so yeah. then it becomes a tangible when it's not previously, yeah. even though we know it. And that gives it this possessive or territorial or meaningful mm-hmm. component. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. This was kind of my commentary, ex, uh, you know, exegesis of Emmanuel Ponty on space. <laughs> that's that's wonderful. And I got to see that movie. But that's a great, great um, explanation. It's a short film. And it's a short film. It's not long. It's, just, it's maybe maybe eighty minutes. It's a great film. It's great. You know, I I try to get at that same idea by way of the image of the earth uh, Mm. in my book. And, Mm -hmm. you know, from, from a particular perspective, you know, the earth is just one planet among many, objectively speaking, it's, it's no more important than any other planet. I mean, they're all planets. Right. Um, But if you look, if you're out in space and you're, you know, you're in the uh, Apollo, whatever it was, the first, the first, uh, you know, um, spaceship to, to look at the planet from afar and you're looking at it and you, and you understand that's home, Mm -hmm. you know, then your perspective on what it means is absolutely utterly different. And if you further reflect that you could not even have that perspective, if you had not been able to, in effect, push off this planet, Mm-hmm. which in some sense is just like any other planet, except for the fact that it's the one planet that allowed you the perspective to even have the idea that it's like any other planet, because it's what right. you literally pushed off from and, and what is, is, you know, your place of origin, everything changes, you know, mm-hmm. and it just keeps going back to what I think so many people have been trying to get at. It's like pure objectivity is meaningless. Mm-hmm. Who cares? Mm-hmm. Pure subjectivity, you you end up, you know, kind of in the same conundrum, you know. It's it's relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, you know, to go back to your your description of, you know, the home in and of itself, the 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 rooms, the objects, they have no particular meaning except that they've been uh, inhabited, you know. They've there's there's been an uh, animate and sold body in those rooms, and it's through that relationship between you know um, a person and the space that the real understanding of meaning mm-hmm. um, is born. And I think again to just kind of bring this back to to you know what we're seeing play out in the culture. Um, I think this is relevant. Because we have kind of like, sometimes there are like warring factions in which, you know, people are trying to reduce what's important to, you know, what the science says. And then, you know, some other faction is, is, is um, arguing the exact opposite. And the thing is, is what's important to us and what's meaningful is never going to be entirely objective and it's never going to be entirely subjective. And we always need to find new creative ways of thinking that dichotomy through. Yeah. And I, and I think the other thing is, is like, you can use an example of this. If there's a fire in your house, what's the first thing you're going to grab? Listen, I don't give a shit about my TV. I buy a new TV, but The, the artifacts I got or the ornaments I got from South America, from the Galapagos Islands, that's the first thing I'm going to grab. That's special to me. That, that, that is an external memory of sorts of, an, of a time and experience I had, which I might, oh, well, I'll definitely not have that experience again, but I you know, might not be able to go there again or something. And um, so, you know, sometimes it might be that I'm very interactive with my books. So there's like certain books I would want. Because I've written in them mm-hmm. and I have a certain kind of experience with them, and and I would I wouldn't want that to go away, you know, or some. So the, usually the things that we place ourselves in more so than just objects are the things we put more value on, right? when they have more of an essence on. Um, you know, it was like a painting I did, right? And I would want that. I can't recreate it necessarily the same way, mm-hmm. um, or things that remind me of an experience. And so yes, I I agree. I think the 
two counterpoints to that about the last point you said is yes, in society, I do see this. There is this, you know, people are, well, this, that we might converge on this very nicely, actually. People have, some people have this allegiance to uh, objective truths, right? Or their objective truths, right? You know, trust the science, you know, until it's not what they want it to be, you know, and not those <laughs> scientific facts. I don't like those, but the ones yeah. I like, you know, yeah. um, there's that whole thing. But even beyond that, there's the, well, let's just stay with the objective because it's true. I know it, it's unemotional and it, it's constant. And look, that's super important. You know, I love the scientific method. I think it's great, but we, we can't act like it's, you know, gospel truth or it's, you know, inerrant from, you know, on high science mm -hmm. gets it wrong too. Right. Um, now I'm not, that's not me and by any means, you know, sowing seeds of doubt in science or anything like that. I, I, science is great and we need to do it. I, I think it's wonderful, but it, it can't answer every single question all the time. It's a lot of in process. And I think scientists that are honest will say that. Hey, we don't know this. That's, sure. the, that's the best thing you can say as a scientist. I'm not sure. I need to figure that out. And then there's the subjective stuff too. It's like, look, uh, who did I have? I had, uh, it was Wilfred Riley. I had him on here. Um, and he, you know, we, I, we were just talking about, he, he's a political scientist and talking about hate crimes and race and stuff like that. And he was just like, you know, I asked about this quantitative versus qualitative stuff within the scientific world, you know, and, and he goes, Look, you can have whatever qualitative experience you want about something. If it's if you're having an experience about something that's factually or quantitatively wrong, that's a real thing. <laughs> Just because you feel it or you have an observation, it doesn't d discredit it, but the facts about it can still be wrong. You can feel or have an experience about however you want, right? So if I if I if I want to say something about the facts of the world, you know, certain, you know, we were talking about crime rates or race relations or things like that. And he's like, you know, if your experience is not commiserate with the general facts, that doesn't devalue or, or wipe out your experience of it. it. It just means that, again, it doesn't mean that it's true for everybody. It doesn't mean that it scales for everybody. It doesn't mean that it's going to be true. I mean, we, we have to be careful with that. So objective, subjective is fine, I think. But I think the thing that does get missed, sort of, is this relationship and, and the, and the in-between and the interpersonal dynamics between people and the connection that we can, we can have and the healthy intimacy that we can have with people. And um, w people, I've said this... Um, we said this uh, another uh, talk I was having about people do philosophy all the time. People are are thinking about these things all the time, right? It, it, philosophy is not. I know it gets a bad rap for being super abstract and not pragmatic, but we, we think about these things all the time. Like I just said, if somebody comes into the house and they disrupt everything, you know, we're having an experience of that, and we can't explain what that is, right? That's some element of phenomenology, right? There's an experience happening that if I try to describe it, it's very hard, but I still can know that it's happening, right, mm -hmm. at, at a certain point. Um, and it's like that for a lot of things. I think that we need to be more, um, again, open, curious about different nodes or modes of experience that we, we may have and, and not immediately try to jump to a moral attribution or a value judgment uh, that we can do that. And that can come later, but I, I don't think that it always needs to be that in the same or moment or every moment. You know, um, the, ah, uh, so much to say. Yeah, um, go ahead, go ahead, please. There's, there's a reason that we continue to write novels and write mm. poetry and mm -hmm. read novels and read poetry. And that's because um, a lot, that that's that's where a lot of the real phenomenology takes place. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's that's where you really get a sense of oh, human beings living things mm -hmm. that are outside of other discourses. You know, it's mm -hmm. and, and I think that's why I think that's why there is a lot of times this 
even a blind um, kind of push against science is there is this intuitive just understanding that look at objective truth is is great but uh, at the same time it's like so what you know mm -hmm. what difference does it make and um and so it's interesting we've got these different ways of apprehending the world and some is through experimentation and some is through talking about objective and universal laws and truths and then we've also got these other ways of writing um that are ancient and mm -hmm. they speak in metaphorical language and they speak of they it's a language of fantasy but it's 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 also a language that resonates with all of us and will continue to resonate um there's a uh I don't know what to call him, the philosopher named Richard Tarnas, and he has a phrase that I really like. He says, we have classical minds and romantic souls. Oh, that's a nice way of saying it, yeah. And he kind of goes back to this, this split that a lot of people are trying to work through, you know. Um, so we're always going to need um, ways of perceiving and thinking about things that um, don't, don't exclude um science and fact and empiricism but also kind of fill in fill in the in-between spaces you know the facts in them in and of themselves are meaningless facts it's like going back to that analogy we had about looking at the planet i mean it's like mm -hmm. planet earth is just i mean who cares right. it's just one planet among others it has no objective importance ah well that's when you bring in the fact that this is our home mm -hmm. you know and uh it has a meaning that is um, undeniable mm -hmm. for us. Yeah, yeah. no, abs absolutely. Okay, so here's here's my my game time decision here. Um, <clears throat> I think I want to give Mister Young uh, his 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 own time, his own due. Uh, I don't want to shortchange him at all. So I'll, I'll, let's put him on the on the bench for, for, for this time. Okay. Uh, cause I want to do, I want to do him justice. Uh, and he's, he's, uh, and, and then him in depth psychology and I can, you know, Carl Jung has so many things to say. Uh, I have some criticisms mm -hmm. and so, you know, yeah. I, I, I think, um, I think I want to, I want to save him for like his own, his own conversation. Um, we've talked about him a little bit, so, but I, I want to really do yeah. him justice. Um, but, um, but yeah, so anything, else you want to say um just thinking about everything we've discussed right we've talked about postmodernism. we talked about uh, at length you know which was very 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 ha happy i feel like a catharsis you know when talking about it with you <laughs> this post i'm glad uh, i felt it felt great uh we talked about a lot of phenomenology here and so it just you know i'm i am uh, all of my endorphins and serotonin are just you know buzzing you know i feel it's really really I, I really like these kind of conversations but is there anything you want to say about any of the stuff we've talked about in those two camps um or, or at all um that will occur to me as soon as we end <laughs> this you know that's how that works yes. um right there's just so much um and we can yeah i mean let's let's come back to it someday and uh I do want to give myself a shameless plug, aldermancoaching.com. Yeah, I was I was going to say tell people where they can find you online and and uh, all the all the the relevant places to 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 see your stuff and to see you and all that. My website is aldermancoaching.com and the book is Symptom Symbol and the Other of Language that's put out by Rutledge in their series on Jungian studies and analytical psychology. And it's a great book. I, I really, and I'm not saying that just because I'm having you on here and you're in front of me. Like it's, I made a tweet about it. Like I, I was, it's a very, very, very good book. Um, I really highly recommend. Thank you. I was going back to it um, a little bit in preparation for for this podcast, and I have to admit, I felt I felt pretty darn proud. It, it, you there's a nice you there's a nice interweaving of kind of mythos and logos. There's yes. a lot of poetic imagery 
coupled with, um, I think, some pretty high level analytical thought. And that's not that's not an easy marriage. <laughs> no, and especially with 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 uh, Derrida and Foucault, I mean, that's not easy writing. I mean, that stuff is no. painful to read, much less oh, understand and, and then write about it, you know? So it, it really, I mean, it's, uh, it's very, very good. Everyone should, should check it out. Um, and that was the other thing we, I, I did want to ask you about the life coach stuff. I mean, uh, so yes, definitely. I'll definitely get you on here again so we can hit all the other issues, but um. And so, so the website, the book, any, anywhere else people need to see you or, or link up to you? Um, well, I'm on Twitter as well, at uh, Dr. Brett Alderman. Okay. And uh, yeah, that's about it. That's, I think that's about, as, uh, it's about all the stuff I have to share. This has been great. I really appreciated this. You're a, you're a great uh, interviewer or, you know, I love the back and forth. Yeah. No, thanks. I appreciate it. I am. Um, uh, all of this is, uh, you know, uh, can't even say labor of love. You know, it's just a, it's a real, just big love. I, I really enjoy uh, talking to people and connecting and bouncing ideas and, and uh, different types of people and pushing myself. But like I said, in the beginning, um, you know, I had you penciled on the schedule months ago. And so I was greatly looking forward to this. I wanted to get you earlier, right? <laughs> so um, it was everything I wanted and more. Um, I greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate your 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 mind and you know how you explain things and um, just being pretty awesome. So thanks for, for coming on and, and uh, sharing all of the great ideas. Great. Thank you very much, Xavier. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.